Confession, Article 27. So let us turn there in the back of our Psalter hymnals. The Holy Catholic Church, Article 27, page 865. 865 in the back of your Trinity Psalter hymnal, the Holy Catholic Church. We believe and confess one single Catholic or universal church, a holy congregation and gathering of true Christian believers awaiting their entire salvation in Jesus Christ, being washed by his blood and sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This church has existed from the beginning of the world and will last until the end as appears from the fact that Christ is eternal King who cannot be without subjects. And this holy church is preserved by God against the rage of the whole world, even though for a time it may appear very small in the eyes of men, as though it were snuffed out. For example, during the very dangerous time of Ahab, the Lord preserved for himself 7,000 men who did not bend their knees to Baal. And so this holy church is not confined, bound, or limited to a certain place or certain persons, but it is spread and dispersed throughout the entire world, though still joined and united in heart and will in one and the same spirit by the power of faith. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 22 through 33. You'll want to keep your Bibles handy because we're going to look at some other texts as we work through this lesson together. Hebrew, or Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 33 is a very unique passage of Scripture because of its ability to really do double duty. Uh, there's not many texts like this in that, on the one hand, Paul is speaking about the responsibilities of husbands and wives to each other, and yet on the other hand, he's speaking about Christ and the church. And so you're reading this and you're wondering, is he talking about husband and wives, or is he talking about the church and his bride, or the church and, and Christ, her husband? And the answer is both. So we're going to look at some of these verses this morning as a reference to Christ and his bride. Ephesians 5 at verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of God. So as we think this morning, we are uh, transitioning from the, the work of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the intercession of Christ. Now we're transitioning in the Belgic to a treatment on the church, the bride of Christ, the people that Christ bought with his blood, whom he loves. And so uh, we're going to work through the next number of weeks as we think about the doctrine of the church. What's actually a very beautiful thing is we've, I commented on this last week, is the beautiful harmony of God's truth. And what often seems to be a coincidence, of course, is no coincidence at all. But I sat in the pew this morning listening to the sermon that was presented from my dad and just realizing how beautifully, it really dovetails into this lesson this morning. Israel was gathered at Mount Ebal and beside Mount Gerizim in the valley, 
in what was a covenant renewal ceremony. And the point was made that and, and emphasized that this occurs in worship. That worship is the specific and peculiar means by which Israel is renewed in her relationship with the sovereign God of grace. And so that's something that we emphasize as well. What is the church? We're going to see that this morning as well. The church is a worshiping community. And one of the things I emphasize to people is I say, like, I'll call you up if you go a few Sundays without coming to church because it's not because, like, I want to see the pews full, which I do. But the point is, is that this is critical. This is so different than just reading your Bible at home. When you gather together in corporate worship, we are renewing our covenant. God is renewing his covenant with us. And we saw that in Joshua chapter 8, that there is a, a renewal ceremony. Vows are made. Uh, sacrifices are offered. And the people are reminded of God's grace. So just think back to that as we look at the New Testament and, and some Old Testament passages as well, that God's people is a called out people, called out of Egypt, brought through the wilderness, and brought into sacred assembly with God. It's an exciting thing as we think about the church. So let me introduce it now, and you can have some notes. I have some of, the, some of my notes printed on this page for your sake. The doctrine of the church is a very important part of the things that we believe and confess. We believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that he was fully human, fully divine. We believe in all these beautiful doctrines of substitutionary atonement. Um, this is also as important. What do you believe about the church? What is the church? Think about that if your coworker asked you, what's the church? Well, you know, you typically just define it in terms of your own experience. Well, we go to church. We worship Jesus at church. A lot of people would think of their church as a building. In fact, a lot of churches will have the, uh, uh, the front picture of their church on their bulletin is the picture of a building. But what is the church? Is it a building? Uh, this is a very important doctrine and worth our consideration. The Apostles' Creed, in it we confess, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. In the Nicene Creed in 325, A.D., we confess, I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. These simple statements of faith are a minefield of truth. From these simple phrases, we confess some important attributes of the church. And so you can see here you have a few blanks that you can write down. I didn't give you the answers, as I sometimes do. But if you look at what I have written above, the Nicene Creed confesses, I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. That's the Nicene Creed. There you have what the Reformed tradition has labeled as the four attributes of the church. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. And the church is apostolic. So those answers are given right in the paragraph ahead. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic and the church is apostolic. And these attributes receive significant treatment in the Belgic Confession. Particularly this morning, we're going to look at the first three. The church is one, the church is holy, and the church is Catholic. Apostolic will come up in some of the succeeding articles. But this is an interesting point. These attributes of the church receive such significant treatment in the Belgic Confession which devotes a total of six articles. So we have 37 articles in the Belgian Confession. We have six of them devoted to the doctrine of the church. Do you think the church was important to the reformers? It was huge. In fact, six articles are devoted to the doctrine of the church, which are followed by three articles that are devoted to the sacraments, which is, of course, the ministry of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So we could really say, strictly speaking, nine articles out of 37 are devoted to the church. More articles are devoted to the church than are devoted to the nature of Christ. God and man. 
More articles are devoted to the church than are devoted to the Holy Spirit. This is a huge doctrine. Why is so much space devoted to the church? Well, remember your context. The Protestants of the Lowlands in Belgium, where Guido de Bray is writing, as well in Holland, were being accused of being seditious to the church and to the state. Remember, Guido de Bray writes this and sends this to King Philip of Spain. They are, the Protestants are being uh, accused of being rebellious toward the church and rebellious toward the state. And so they are being persecuted incredibly harshly. The Roman Catholic Church, again, looking at the context, the Roman Catholic Church had become so corrupt, so worldly, so superstitious, so full of false teaching, that it was imperative to give thorough, substantial treatment to the doctrine of the church. Imagine that you and your fathers and grandfathers and your family had been in the church, had been believers for, for, for a long time, for generations, and, and your kids don't even know Latin. And the sacraments are, Lord's Supper is rarely done, and all the vestments and penance and indulgences, and, and all the reformers begin dismantling these things. And you're wondering, what is the church? What is this thing that we go to every Sunday? What is it? Who are its members? How does it operate? What is its purpose? Where do we fit in? You can see why this is an important thing. I think this is just as important today. We have Baptists, and Presbyterians, and Methodists, and you know, we have non-denominationals, we have Lutherans, and we have Reformed, we have Presbyterians, and we have a smorgasbord. What's the church? Who are we? I think this is important. So let's look at the first attribute of the church, the singleness of the church. The Belgic Confession states the following, we believe and confess one single Catholic or universal church. So we confess that there is, strictly speaking, one church. Even though there are many individual, visible manifestations of the one church, there is, strictly speaking, one church. So here are some, uh, some of the manifestations that we have here. Paul addresses his letters to particular churches in various places. Listen to these quotes of Scripture. We have an address to the church of God that is in Corinth. We have an address to the saints that are in Ephesus. We have an address to particular churches, to the churches of Galatia. The churches in Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. John speaks similarly in the book of Revelation. John addresses his letter to the churches that are in Asia, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, and so on and so forth to those seven churches. So point being is you might read that and think there's not one church, there's many churches. I just addressed the church in Ephesus, Galatia, Corinth, etc. But all those individual particular manifestations of the church are manifestations of one church. There is one body of Christ. And so listen to these other scriptures. So I gave you examples of particular individual visible manifestations of the church. But the scriptures will also speak otherwise, that there is one church. For example, Jesus said to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Singular. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He did not say, I will build my churches. And he said, I will, he did not refer to, um, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It. He didn't say them. He said it, singular. So we see the, uh, go in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter uh, 2. So Ephesians is a very beautiful letter about the church. And we see the same emphasis in Ephesians chapter 1, rather. Ephesians chapter 1. 
Verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Or turn to Ephesians chapter 5, the passage that we read. Verse 23, Christ is the head of the church, singular. Uh, verse 25, Christ loved the church, singular. He gave himself up for her. So the point is, is that all these visible manifestations, the church in Colossae, the church in Corinth, the church in Ephesus, are really visible manifestations like spokes on a wheel of the one wheel. There's one church. There's one body of Christ. This singleness of the church is further supported by the various images or pictures that the Bible gives us of the church. And so you have a few bullet points here where you can fill in some blanks. What are some of the images of the church that you uh, know of from the Bible? I already mentioned one of them, if you were listening. The church is the body of Christ. That was one of them. The church is the body of Christ. The church is also the bride of Christ. Christ loved the church. That's Ephesians chapter 5. Um, verse 23, Christ is the head of the church, his body. There we have that. But then we go on also in the rest of this passage where the church is presented as his bride. We also have in Revelation chapter 21 that the church is the lamb's wife. We have a bride, a wife, a body. We have other images. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the flock of the good shepherd, the household of God. All of these images are given to us of the church. Christ is not a polygamist. He doesn't have two wives or 20 wives. He is one wife, one bride. He doesn't have multiple temples. He's not a, a worshiper of other gods. He is one temple. He is one body. He's not some kind of a monster. Ephesians chapter 4, go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, there is one body and one spirit, referring to the church. So the church is one. Think about what I read here in John chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, one flock. One shepherd, one body, one bride, one wife, one temple of the Holy Spirit. We are living stones built upon a cornerstone. There's one edifice. There's one structure. So these are all images that you can be writing down in those, in those blanks. Body, bride, temple, flock, household, family of God. Peter adds his own images. Peter says of the believers that they were a chosen race, a race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So these are unique terms because they're collective and singular at the same time, like the word flock. A flock is made up of many sheep, but Christ doesn't have flocks. He is a flock. A race is made up of many people, but it's one singular race, a Caucasian race. Right, A royal priesthood made up of many priests, but it's one priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, Peter or Paul uses another analogy we're coming up to where he refers to them as citizens. Many people, but citizens of one country. So we have all these images that Peter now adds as well. Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation. The word people is a technical term in the Old Testament to refer to God's constituted people, a people. And then there's other words that are also added as well. If you're, if you're writing it in three different lines, the third line, the church is called a congregation in the Old Testament. It's an Old Testament word, kahal, a called out people, or the Greek word ekklesia, assembly. The church is an, an assembly of people. Got all these words here um, that will refer to the church and um, Ephesians chapter 2 at verse 19, 
are some of the other ones I just added. See it, Ephesians 2.19. Citizens, citizens of one country, members of a singular household of God. We see here the image of a temple. You see in verse 21, a structure. You see in verse 22, a dwelling place being dwelt together. This is the church, the singleness of the church. There is one church, one people of God. Why is this important that we confess that the church is one, that the Belgian Confession says right out of the gates, we believe and confess one single Catholic or universal church? Well, first of all, these aren't in any particular order, but first of all, it says that God does not have two peoples, an Old Testament people and a New Testament people. In fact, if you were listening closely when my dad was preaching, he dropped those kind of lines saying that we are part of that community. There is one people, there is one church. God doesn't have an Old Testament people, the Jews, and a New Testament people, the Gentiles. The significance of this is the following. Gentile Christians are not second-class citizens in God's kingdom. Paul said of Christ in Ephesians chapter 2 at verse 14, you can look there in your Bible, for Christ himself is our peace who has made us both one, one church, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And then Paul goes on to describe this one new man, this body of Christ as sharing an equal citizenship of the same country, country of heaven, of a household and a structure, a temple and a dwelling place. This is significant. This goes against the stream of modern evangelical faith that says, well, the Jews were God's special people and God had a special covenant with them and us Gentiles, we're just lucky to be grabbed along the way before the apocalypse happens. No, not at all. We were part of God's plan. There's one people. There's one bride, not two brides. This idea, this doctrine that there is one church speaks to the inherent and essential unity of the church. God does not have an Asian church and an African church and an American church. There is one church. Related to this, this unity, and this singleness shows that all the members of the church and every particular manifestation of the body of Christ in different localities, all are equally loved and treasured by the king of the church. God, not, God does not have his prized bull that's there in the front paddock and all the rest are back there. He doesn't have his prized flock and then he has these other renegade flocks in the back 40 somewhere that every particular manifestation of the body of Christ and every individual believer in Jesus Christ is equally precious in the sight of the Lord. A little three- and four-year-old covenant child is as dear to Christ as the Apostle Peter for whom Christ prayed. The elderly saint who's who's gone through life trusting in the Lord and has believed in Christ is as precious to God and as equally a member in Christ's church as the great evangelistic Apostle Paul. There is one church, one bride of Christ. Why is it important that we confess there is one single church, one, as I said, there's not a New Testament, Old Testament group. There's not a Jewish church and a Gentile church. There's one church. But also this is important given the historical context in which the Belgic Confession was written. This is against the accusation levied against the Protestants that they were starting another church. The Catholics, I mean the Pope, the Cardinals, the bishops, the priests. They're saying, you Protestants, you're renegades. You're mavericks. We excommunicate you. You're starting another church. And Guido de Bray is putting his foot down and saying adamantly, no, we aren't. There is one church. We are the continuation 
of the true church. That's the way Protestants have always looked at it. Every time there's some kind of a church split, as there always will be till Christ returns, there's always a remnant coming out, and the remnant is always saying, we are the continuing manifestation of the one single church of Jesus Christ. And in fact, it's not a coincidence. As Guido de Bray writes in Article 27, there's one church that in Article 29, he then goes on to describe the marks of the true church versus the marks of the false church. He says, it's like there's one true church, and we're it, and Rome is not. There's one church. So that's the second point. Given the historical context of the confession, they are saying we are the continuing church of Christ. Thirdly, this is important because it helps us understand the visible church in the world that we see around us. And as it does, it directs our attention to the spirituality of the church and to the essential unity of the church. What makes a church one is not that it all belongs to the same denomination. So see, this is a conversation I've had with some of you. Um, maybe not you all here, but I have had this conversation being here in Twin Falls. That sometimes people think that the church needs to be one, so all the pastors need to get together and pray together. And we need to do ministries together with, with Magic Valley Bible Church and Eastside Baptist Church, and we need to get together and we need to do fellowship together because the church needs to be one, and we all need to have the same banner. But you see, that totally misses the boat on this singleness of the church. The singleness of the church is, is essentially spiritual, and one day will be visible when all the people of God are gathered together under the banner of Christ. But look at it this way. This is the accusation we get against, we get against Catholics, the accusation we also get against Mormons. Mormons and Catholics will both say to Protestants and say, you guys are all not one. You got denominations, you got Methodists, and you and you got your United Methodists, and you have your Baptists and your Presbyterians and your Lutherans, and you got your Reformed, and you got all your non-denominational churches and your community churches and your evangelical churches, and even amongst the Baptists, you have fundamental Baptists and independent Baptists, and you have you have amongst Presbyterians and amongst Reformed, you know, we can just keep splicing this and splicing this, and they say the church is not one. Look how divided it is. This doctrine is critical for us today as it was for them back then. Denominations are the invention of men. That's okay. They are invention of men for the well-being of the church. So in fact, even in our own church order that the URC follows, we say in our church order, these rules that we have put together for how we do church do not belong to the essence of, church, of the church, but to the well-being of it. Your family gets together and you've set some rules. This is when we do supper, and when we do supper, all the kids sit down at the table because we do supper together. You have your own rules, right? For the functioning of your church. So wise and godly men have sat down and said, we need some structure based upon scripture for how we can do church with integrity. So denominations, we're in a day and age where some people think denominations are all bad. Non-denominational churches are the best thing. They're not. Personally, I believe they're dangerous, and there's a lot of risk to them. Denominations or federations, as some are called, are good for accountability, for encouragement, for support, for mutual engagement in missions, uh, for, for exercises of church discipline, we go outside of our body, do other churches that we have covenanted with. Whenever we pr proceed to a point of excommunication, we go beyond ourselves and get their advice and their support. So you see here, and we can say that with, you got Presbyterians. Now, not every church that I've listed, you know, like the United Methodists, they're not even a church anymore. I'm just throwing out names. So you think of some good Baptist churches and some good Reformed churches. You've got all these different den denominations. They all represent like spokes on a wheel, the one church. We're going to look at the marks in a couple weeks, and we'll say of those churches, some are more true and some are more false than others, and some will just plain call false churches. 
like the Roman Catholic Church. But I like this analogy of, uh, of Israel divided into 12 tribes. Tribe of Levi, tribe of Judah, tribe of Benjamin, like denominations, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Reformed, Baptists, like the 12 tribes of Israel, they made one nation. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That was the church. That was Israel. So it's important to believe this because you need this in your arsenal. When people look at the Protestant churches, you Protestants are all divided. There's no unity there. But the Roman Catholic Church, that's, that's united. And you say, they really aren't. Neither are the Mormons. There's all different fragments and sects in the Mormons. But we're united, not because we all go under the same banner of United Reformed or Presbyterian or whatever. What makes us one is our faith in Christ. And that's where this Belgic Confession, Article 27, ends. One in the same spirit by the power of faith. It's faith in Christ that unites us. So, brothers and sisters, the church is one. One body, one bride, one temple, united to one Lord. We'll continue with the identity of the church until the kids come up. We confess, furthermore, that the church is a holy congregation and gathering of true Christian believers awaiting their entire salvation in Jesus Christ, being washed by his blood and sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have here a a definition of the church. What is this group of people that gathers together for public worship? And what stands out in this, this is a good definition. What stands out in this definition is that the body that gathers together each Lord's Day is a body that identifies themselves specifically as washed in the blood of Jesus. A community that has been saved by grace. Community that has been sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Again, this is just so good theology for us. What identifies us is not common interests. It's not common nationality. It's not common pursuits. It's not wealth or health. It's not race. What what is it that, that brings us and identifies us and constitutes us? It's the blood of Christ. I remember this. I've used this analogy a long time ago, but my dad will remember it. I remember it when I was a kid and it'd come time for him to ship the hogs. I grew up on a, my dad was a hog farmer. He would take those pigs and you'd take them out of the pens and you'd get a pen with five and a pen with three and a pen with ten. You don't want them all in different pens and you'd put tractor oil over all of the ones that were left behind, right? Now they all are the same. And they don't fight each other because they all smell the same. Put them into pens. All the pigs were put underneath the oil. One barn all covered in oil. We're one people all covered with the blood of Christ. Every one of us covered with the blood of Christ. Everybody who believes in Jesus has passed through the blood of Christ. That's what it is for us. Who are we? What are we? Ephesians 1 verse 13 says that believers are those who have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Acts 20 verse 28, Paul says to the Ephesian elders, care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. What are we? What is the church? It's not a building. And it's not simply a people. For Kiwanis society is a people. And the nation of America is a people. But what are we as a people? What is the church? It's a people who individually and collectively have passed through the waters of Christ's blood. The Red Sea waters. A people that he has purchased and bought sealed and sanctified with his spirit. So you see that the church is such a very different thing than anything the world knows. Um, We're going to look as we continue next week at the other attributes of the church as we work through this. The church is holy. That's the one that we're going through right now. 
And then next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up with that, the holiness of the church, perseverance of the church, and the universality of the church, what it means that it's Catholic. Um, so something to look forward to next week. But I think one of the things that's so beautiful about just taking, this might take a couple months to work through this doctrine of the church, is that I believe even in the Reformed tradition, we have to have a rekindled love for the church. Why do we gather together each Sunday? Not just because we need to be fed. Not just because we, we need the Word of God. Not just because we need to worship and give God His praise, which we do. We gather together each Sunday because we love the church. This is God's family. And we love it when family gets together. We're God's children purchased by the blood of Christ and, and carried out of the world. That's who you are. Let's love the church. Pray for the church. Christ loved the church. So should we. Let's, um, let us sing. And um, I'm going to save a mighty fortress is our God. We're going to save that for when we get to the perseverance of the church. And we're going to sing instead, I love thy kingdom, God. And I'm going to find that for you.